Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this year, UCL's famed uh, lunch hour lecture series include a few talks under the label Encore, the term which describes when, after some enthusiastic applause, applause sorry, performers return to the stage to dazzle the audience with another performance. As an Encore performer, the UCL events team invited today's speaker back to the lectern as his 2011 talk is among the most watched lunch hour lectures on UCL's YouTube channel, uh, with tens of thousands of views. The topic last time was against nature, question mark, homosexuality and evolution. More about that in a second. Uh, allow me first to introduce myself. My name is Alexandra Palmer, and I'm currently completing my PhD in UCL's Department of Anthropology. I do this under the supervision of today's speaker, and it is therefore my honor and pleasure to present Volker Summer to you. He is indeed a bit of UCL royalty. As a well-respected professor of evolutionary anthropology, Volker has enriched our beloved university with already half a dozen lunch hour lectures over the past 20 years. He studied in Germany, then went on to work in countries such as India, the US, Thailand, and Nigeria. Over the last 40 years, he has become well known for his field studies on wild monkeys and apes. Based on his research in the jungles of Asia and Africa, Volker was one of the first researchers to demonstrate that same-sex sexual inclinations are not a unique trait of human primates, but homosexual tendencies are instead found throughout the animal kingdom. Thus, Volker early on criticized those conservative voices who discriminate against non-straight behaviors and identities on the alleged ground of being against nature. But if wild gorilla males do it with each other on the slopes of East Africa's Virunga Mountains, and wild bonobo females engage in homosexual sex in the Congo Basin, and sacred Indian temple monkeys get pleasure out of having sex with members of their own, well, sex, then clearly sexual behavior is not a black and white affair. Instead, sexual identities are fluid, and we should accept and celebrate this natural fact in our cultural frameworks as well. Therefore, as an evolutionary anthropologist, and mind you, we're in Darwin's lecture theater currently, Volker embodies a decidedly gradualist view and abhors strict dogmatic categorizations. In particular, simple binaries such as male versus female, straight versus gay, and nature versus culture. Today, he will try to deconstruct another outdated binary, the dichotomy of humans versus animals. He will do that by exploring the merits and shortcomings of the emerging concept of non-human personhood. He will ask questions such as, is a chimpanzee a thing or a person? Or is an orangutan an item of property or a being with legal rights? Incidentally, as Volker will explain, the first non-human ape who was granted legal rights as a non-human person is an orangutan. This recent development is very close to my own research and heart, as my PhD research considers ethical perspectives related to the thousands of unfortunate orangutans who, because their forest habitats have been destroyed, are kept in rehabilitation centers across Sumatra and Borneo. The question of non-human personhood is argued across the globe by lawyers, philosophers, and scientists. What is your own position on this debate? Are you somebody who maintains that only humans can, maintain, can hold rights, or do you wish to grant entitlements to non-humans as well? Well, let's welcome a competent guide through this labyrinth of thought, who will take us on a journey from the wilderness to the laboratory to the courtroom, following what might be the dawn of a new era of inclusivity. With this, finally, over to one of my favorite great apes, Professor Volker Sommer. <laughs> Thank you so much for the kind words. All I ever wanted to do was run around in forests and be fascinated by wild animals. And I ended up having to understand words like this, complicated words which surely have little to do with monkeys and apes, it may seem. But that's the vocabulary which is emerging in the animal rights debate. Animal rights, well, they also pertain to myself because I'm an animal after all. You see me here sneaking into the picture on the left side. I wanted to be close to Darwin on the right side. But of course, I also wanted to be close to all my close kin all kinds of monkeys and apes. The difference being that both Darwin and I are considered to be persons. We have certain rights and entitlements, whereas all the other primates in the middle are basically chattel, 
They can be bought and sold like furniture. Uh, one can take their lives away if one thinks that's like necessary to develop drugs that help humans, etc., etc. Um, however, there are people who have questioned such approach, and the two prominent ones who did that first are Professor Peter Singer on the left-hand side, a philosopher, and his philosopher colleague, Paola Cavalieri. And they said, okay, hang on, so there has been development over the last couple of hundred years that whoever is a human, whoever is considered to be a human, should be included in what's called the community of equals. All humans are equal before the law. They all have basic rights which cannot be taken away from them. And they would say, well, why should it only be humans who have these rights? And they called for an enlargement of the community of equals. And they started what is called the Great Ape Project. So great apes, as I will later uh, specify again, are uh, certain types of primates, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and chimpanzees, and of course humans, who logically are also great apes. But only the human great apes currently have these entitlements, meaning at least on paper or in a court of law, uh, we tend to be granted a right to life, a right to liberty, a right to bodily integrity, to autonomy, if you want, because we are persons. And those who demand that the community of equals should be enlarged maintain that these basic rights should also be given to our closest living relatives. The areas where this would have implications, legal implications, are, for example, should be allowed to keep such animals in zoos for their whole lives, behind bars, in more or less good conditions. Should it be allowed to consume them, as it's done widely in many countries of the world, where they are considered to be bushmeat? How is that with experimenting upon them in laboratories, which is banned in quite a few countries, but not in others? And how is it if we go about and we say, you and I, we need resources, we need wood for this lecture theater, let's cut down the trees, because after all, these are resources, and um, whoever the inhabitants may be in such forests, they surely don't have a right which they can bring to a court. Now, I know that when I talk about these issues, people tend to think that it's related to nature conservation or to um, what you might uh, want to call uh, the preservation of species in the wild. Now, it's very important to understand that I'm talking about individual rights. I'm talking not about the chimpanzee species where somehow we should protect chimpanzees because they are beautiful animals and it's important that they are somehow around. I'm talking about individuals and their individual lives. That is the animal rights perspective as opposed, so to speak, to a nature conservation perspective. And when we talk about individuals, the task at hand would be to remove what can be called legal discrimination. There have been many legal discriminations against other humans throughout the centuries. One famous one would be the ideology of religionism, meaning only if you have a certain religion, you can do certain things. For example, before UCL came into being, when you wanted to study at the university here in Great Britain, you had to belong to the Anglican Church. And UCL was the first one who did away with that kind of religionism, because here you didn't have to belong to a particular creed, and you could study anyway. Um, then there is, of course, the ideology of racism, that ethnic groups are not entitled to the same rights. They can be treated differently, exploited in different ways, preferred in different ways. Then there is the ideology of sexism. The person you see here is, incidentally, my daughter, and she was born into a canton in Switzerland, uh, she 
wouldn't have had a right to vote because at that time women didn't have a right to vote in that particular part of Switzerland. That has now changed, but it was clearly a case of sexism. Then we have heterosexism, where of course it's all about, okay, there are males and females, and whoever doesn't fit into that black and white um, category um, has a problem, but that's not my problem because of course I nicely fit into the pigeonhole. Um, all these discriminatory concepts have been questioned throughout the centuries with more or less success. Um, they have been brought to court uh, by numerous lawyers throughout the centuries and more or less uh, decisions have been made to remove these kind of discrimination concepts. The last, if you want, frontier is the frontier of speciesism a term which was coined by Richard Ryder in Oxford a couple of decades ago who was thinking, hmm, how can we call that actually if just because you do not belong to what is called the human race or the human species, just because you're not a human, you are not entitled to have certain uh, privileges. And he coined that term of speciesism. So what I try to talk about today is arguments for keeping our distinction between humans and animals alive. I will present the conservative voices and their arguments for why it's right to just give rights to humans. And I will present arguments from, if you want, the left spectrum where people say, well, I mean, if you want to give rights to great apes, you are as bad as any other racism because you're just creating a new divide the divide between great apes and all the other animals. So that's not really progress. Before I do that, I want to put a little bit of meat onto the historic development of that debate. It started out by uh, two publications, which the first one actually had the title The Great Ape Project, edited by Paola Cavalieri and Peter Singer, and a lot of um, evolutionary biologists in particular lend their voice to um, that uh, particular demand which uh, Cavalieri and uh, uh, Singer were furnishing. Now, I was involved in the year 2004 in the first court case which was fought for a non-human ape, for a chimpanzee called Hirsel who uh, had been uh, captured as a baby after his mother had been killed in West Africa and had been brought to Austria, where uh, he was supposed to be experimented upon in a biomedical lab. And uh, we now fought a court case saying that this, ch this chimpanzee uh, isn't a thing. It's not chattel. It's not something that should be uh, bought and sold. but should be considered to be a person. We fought that court case throughout all the different courts in Switzerland up to the European Human Rights Court and we lost in every single instance. However, we were always allowed to proceed uh, because the judges said, well, it's really an issue that should be considered. At this time, we are not willing to consider that uh, favorably, but a higher court should decide that. Anyway, in 2007 or so, uh, the last appeal was lost. Um, I then started to make more noises in the German-speaking world, gathering, uh, if you want, compatriots in this battle, such as philosophers. And I was able to publish a book uh, which was supported by Germany's largest private science funding institution, the Volkswagen Stiftung. And uh, I published a book under the title Apes Like Us, which was then distributed in Germany. And in Germany, we modeled a humanist association after the first humanist association, which actually in here in Britain um, came up in the 19th century and has its headquarters still here at Gower Street. And we call our humanist association the uh, Foundation for Evolutionary Humanism. We have a very nice headquarter at the Rhine River in Germany, 
and there is a couple of dozen, uh, dozen um, intellectuals who support these courses. Amongst the cause which we are uh, fighting for is actually the course cause of rights for great apes. We started to produce leaflets, we gave public talks, and I had tried that already 20 years ago. When I talked about these things 20 years ago, it didn't work. The audience was totally baffled. They thought, this guy is crazy. What does he want with these apes there and rights? And just the time wasn't right. Now, since four or five years, this has completely changed. When I now talk about these topics, often many people are interested, they are really fired up, and by and large, they are willing to consider that. So there's clearly a, a, a zeitgeist element to it. At least in the German-speaking world, we managed to make a lot of headlines. In the biggest newspapers, everybody would carry these stories, and they still do. The same traction is uh, gathering speed in the United States, for example, and also here in Britain. Increasingly, people are putting that onto the agenda. It's debated in uh, television and so on. So the time seems to be right. What is it about what this actually is? I believe it has to do with the queer discourse. The queer discourse would be the discourse where you question boundaries. And of course, there can be boundaries between people with different skin colors or people with different sexual identities or people with different religious beliefs or non-religious beliefs, etc. And queer studies try to understand how much ambiguity tolerance we are willing to develop in our own approach to life. Instead of putting everything in a category which nicely fits, uh, are we able to somehow develop a mindset which is more gradualistic, where the borders are not totally set, but where we recognize, and then there are all these nice words like the rainbow of life or the rainbow of this and that. Um, and the debate about rights for uh, great apes belongs into that discourse, in my opinion. I was, as has already been pointed out, drawn into that by incidental observations which I first made in the wild about non-straight sexual behavior in monkeys and apes, and I published about that, and that became an argument uh, that in nature there is much more mm, fluidity than we normally uh, presume. And with that agenda, I then fitted my arguments for the Great Ape Project. Before I talk about the arguments then, I will just introduce some of the Great Apes. Of course, you know all their names. I've selected four little video clips, which somehow, I believe, should make anybody question that these animals are not animals that are so similar to us that really we should not consider that they are things or that, can, that they can be property. I start with a little uh, video about an orangutan in the wild. I start with a little video. Mm. And here you can see various, if you want, human-like behaviors. So there's the older orangutan who, with a younger one, wants to cross a river. So clearly the young one is distressed. The old one says, okay, wait a second. I first have to find out how deep the river is. And he takes a stick, which is a tool, and he is uh, gauging the depth of the river. Interestingly, the stick isn't good enough. He takes a bigger stick because the river is even deeper. And the little one is concerned. Oh my God, are you going away? Please come back. So now the big orangutan will go into the middle of the river because probably in uh, his head he has the idea that it's like in a bathtub, there is a deepest point and then it goes up again. So there is some physical intelligence too. He comes back and then invites the young orangutan to travel across uh, the river. So here are all kind of features which if these animals would be humans, we would say, well, yeah, clearly. They express compassion, uh, they're helpful, they can think into the future, they plan, they use tools. Just because they are animals, we may 
say, oh, no, no, maybe that's all instinct and really, I mean, not much is going in, in their heads. I show you another example about very human-like behavior of a great ape. In this case, a video of the bonobo Kanzi, who has been brought up uh, in a captive setting, in a very big uh, setting, uh, and Kanzi uh, has access to a forest and so on, and he can actually play Pac-Man. So in Pac-Man, you have to move the pointer so that you eat these little pearls, which give you energy, and you have to escape from these monsters who want to eat you. Now, Pac -Man per uh, uh, Kanzi perfectly well understands what he has to do. Now, what's going on in his head? Isn't that like what would be going on in your head or my head. Um, how can we say that this is but an animal and that there is a sharp divide between humans and other animals? Okay, you've got to hide. But then, hmm, ultimately. Um, and you can, of course, it's very, it's a cheap trick which I'm playing on you because I'm showing you all kind of animal behavior, and they say, well, I mean, aren't they really like humans? But I believe that such an intuitive approach is actually a perfect legitimate approach. In the next video, I present to you a video clip which um, we were fortunate to gather in Nigeria at a study site which I direct, and you see a mother chimpanzee uh, manufacturing a stick tool to then insert the stick tool into this black heap, which is actually an assemblage of bees' nests, and inside there is honey. And she clearly understands that she has to press hard to break through the mold. She has two offspring with her, who are also, of course, very interested in the honey. Um, and to develop all kind of interesting little tricks of how to get the honey. The older one uh, is a little bit smarter and knows I just have to put my fingers there, then I will get <laughs> some of the honey. Um, and of course we know that since decades that um, non-human apes can um, use certain tools to obtain food in the wild. Finally, I want to show to you uh, a famous YouTube video. It's the video of a boy who fell in the United States, they tend to always do that, these boys, into uh, a gorilla enclosure. And uh, as you probably know, there is a female gorilla who will now take care of that unconscious boy. This video should illustrate that not only humans are able to cross the species barrier, not only humans are able to have empathy for members of another species, it also works the other way around. Here the zoom will nicely show you how much tenderness is expressed by the gorilla female when she holds the unconscious boy in her um, hands and arms and transports the boy to the back door of the enclosure where help can arrive. Okay, I just wanted to manipulate you a little bit by showing obvious examples which blur that boundary between the human great apes and uh, non-human great apes. Fine, but what about the real arguments? Isn't that really a little bit far-fetched? I first present you with a couple of arguments which come from the conservative camp. So these voices would say, well, really, I mean, get a grip, that's nonsense. One argument would be that it's already enough what we do, we humans. We, we have all kind of laws that, you know, prevent animal cruelty and that say you should uh, save nature, etc., etc. The counter argument would be that these are actually paternalistic arguments. They don't argue from the point of view that non-human animals are autonomous and that they have certain uh, intrinsic uh, desires and rights which should be respected. The next argument would be, well, clearly apes cannot have human rights. To which I would then say, well, if you use the term so loosely, 
there are apes which have human rights because after all humans are rights. Uh, and, uh, after all humans are apes. Then we could say, oh, of course that's not what I meant. I meant apes can't have human rights because there is a genus called Homo and non-human apes don't belong to that genus. To which I could say, well, that's actually, that may be, but there are quite a few geneticists, uh, anatomists, behavioral ecologists who question that distinction that chimpanzees and bonobos and perhaps also gorillas do not belong to the genus Homo. It's actually a historic development. People didn't want animals in the genus Homo. And they consciously said, no, that should not be. And a German scientist named Blumenbach made really a case for it. He says, I mean, uh, that's sacrilege, it's blasphemy. Uh, humans should be alone. And other animals should be in a different genus. But that classification is increasingly questioned. We can also say that, well, yeah, I mean, linguistically, uh, what now? Uh, apes cannot have human rights, to which I say, well, yeah, right, it's not about human rights. The point is about rights which are not tied to a specific species. It's about basic rights which are not, um, by definition, um, only applicable to humans. Another objection could be to say, well, only humans are persons, and only persons can have rights. To which I would say there are all kinds of persons which are the most unlikely of persons. For example, in Christian theology, the Holy Trinity, each of these three parts, the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father, they're all a person. Uh, that was a big debate, and many, many tens of thousands of people have died for that belief. Um, they are persons. So if the Holy Trinity can be a person, or Ryanair, who is also a person, clearly a gorilla, uh, you know, might have more claim to personhood. Um, if we talk about rights, fair enough, maybe a right to life, but they're all kind of rights, a right to vote, uh, uh, a, a right to education, and so on, a right to free speech. Should there be a right to free speech for orangutans? Uh, to which I would say, even for humans, rights are tailored often to meet specific abilities or needs. Not everybody has all the rights. If you're in prison, for example, in Britain, you can't vote. In other countries, you can vote. So there are always exceptions to, to rights issues, but they don't question the general approach of personhood. What about that rights entail duties? Only if you can fulfill duties uh, and only if you can have responsibilities are you entitled to rights. That's turning the idea of rights uh, in totally the wrong uh, direction because rights are not earned. It's not like you behave in a certain way and for that reason uh, rights are given to you. Rights are entitlements which are simply there for you because you exist. And you are somebody who is a human and therefore you have rights no matter whether you can exercise responsibility or not, and a lot of humans cannot do that. So rights can exist without duties and responsibilities. What about if you have rights, then you should have responsibility and you can be punished? Same idea here. There are always exceptions, and there are exceptions in law which say that, yes, um, you may have broken the law, but there are mitigating circumstances for you. Finally, animals don't want to have rights. Um, and therefore, they are not legally capable. They haven't asked for it. To which one would say that, well, there are quite a few humans who haven't asked to have rights, but there are guardians who take up their case. There are those who speak for them. And that would be the legal construct one would use in case of great ape rights. What about the argument that uh, it is sort of cynical to demand rights for apes when even not all humans have the ability to, to exercise their rights? Here is a picture of the women who were fighting to have a right to vote here in Britain. With that argument, they shouldn't have done that because at the time when they did that, most men in Britain didn't have a right to vote because 
the right to vote was tied to owning land. So it's really not so wise, I would say, to say that um, one should wait until the last discrimination has disappeared before one moves to the next step. If apes have rights, what about my cat and my dog? Uh, you know, I mean, soon or later, people will come and will ask for such rights. Um, yes, that may be, uh, but the argument is not fielded because people will say, yeah, I mean, let's consider whether cats or dogs may also have rights. The argument is normally fielded because it's a conservative voice which warns against the slippery slope. So let's not do that. I mean, at the very end, we will all be reigned by robots, and there will be a cat court, and God knows what. Um, we will have to close down all the zoos. Wouldn't that be a problem? I'm not actually too much of a friend of zoos as they exist currently, but um, the irony is that there are thousands upon thousands of great apes in captivity. And those who would really in some ways benefit from great apes being given rights, because many more resources would be poured into that course, are um, zookeepers, for example, because they would have work for decades to come to implement uh, uh, these laws, and it's not possible to release the thousands and thousands of great apes which are in captivity into the wild. We just can't do that because there is no habitat left. Um, so they shouldn't be afraid of uh, these developments taking place. Now, for the next five minutes, I move towards the progressive objections, where animal rights advocates will say, well, really, yeah, I mean, that, you're not going far enough. This is just a rather lame thing to call for rights for great apes. One argument would be that you are just creating a new divide. Instead of having anthropocentrism, where humans are in the center of attention, you now have hominidism, for example, because they, that's the Latin norm, name, let's say, for, for all great apes. Um, the counter argument would be that, well, perhaps this can be a door opener. So people are probably more willing to accept uh, basic rights for great apes uh, here in the West than they would be willing to accept basic rights for mice or for sheep. But you've got to start somewhere. So on the other hand, y nobody is prevented, if I call for rights for great apes, to call for rights for other creatures, whether they are dogs or monkeys or small apes, or what will be creatures at one point, robots. That's up to you. If you want to uh, be a lobbyist for other um, organisms or beings in the world, then do it. And in fact, those who started the Great uh, Ape Project are also active by calling for rights for other types of animals, uh, for example, cetaceans, whales, or elephants. So these movements already exist. In a place like India, there are um, laws in various Indian states that prohibit uh, cow slaughter on the basis of the idea that they are persons. So people are not prevented to come up with their own agenda simply because I say, I use my energy to fight for the right of great apes. That argument which our um, saint of UCL, Jeremy Bentham, was uh, providing is a very serious argument. Um, why only rights for certain types of animals? It should be rights for all those who are able to have feelings for all those who are able to suffer. And here is his famous quote, which I just will read out because it's actually a very important quote. The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Um, that's a serious issue, and we would now come into the bigger discussions about our lifestyle, what we eat, should we support industrial production of meat, what about the dairy industry, 
all these billions and billions of mammals who are slaughtered each year to feed us. So clearly, there is a much bigger picture looming than just talking about great apes. Karl Marx had an interesting um, term, uh, the commodification, meaning we tend to be very capitalist in wanting to uh, divide the world into haves and have-nots, and those who have will tend to have more rights than those who have not. And instead of, um, however, I could argue and I could say, well, that may be so. This is a uto utopian view which uh, Marx has, the comprehensive, comprehensive liberation. But maybe a, a more or less is better than an all or nothing. Maybe a compromise approach is better than an abolitionist approach. The final argument would be, well, it may take forever, and that will not happen, that you will live to see uh, that uh, great apes have rights, to which I would say, yeah, I mean, campaigns often take decades. Campaigns against discrimination often take decades. And I started the whole thing together with many others 20, 30 years ago, and now I can actually see the first cracks in the wall. Our colleagues in Argentina, animal rights lawyers, have fought court cases on behalf of two great apes. The first one was an orangutan, who originally came from Germany, Sandra, and the courts in Argentina have now granted that orangutan personhood. The same happened a short while later for a chimpanzee. So there are now already two uh, legal persons who are non-human great apes. And there are famous other headlines that not only great apes can be persons, there is a trend, so to speak, to give personhood to um, natural entities, to rivers, to forests, and so on. Maybe future generations will be puzzled by our speciesism in much the same way as we are looking at racism, sexism, and heterosexism. That's my prediction, and with that, I leave you hopefully very puzzled, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Volker, for the thought-provoking talk. Um, we've now got a few minutes for some questions. Um, there are a couple of roving mics that will be coming down from either side. Please wait until the microphone's in front of you before you speak. Um, please, just one question per person and try to keep it short. Thanks. Anyone? Yeah, got one here. Hi. Uh, humans are nasty enough to other humans, whether they have, whether we have rights or not. Why should um, giving animals human rights make us behave any differently towards them? I could not understand you. Humans are nasty enough to other humans yes. who supposedly have the same rights. Why would granting animals rights make any difference? Well, it's not good to be nasty to other humans. So, <laughs> you know, just if, because there is a bad example, that doesn't mean we should say, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. Wouldn't it be rather right to say, let's work on our nastiness and to bring legal challenges to those who are nasty is one way of doing it. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Sommers for the very enlightening uh, lecture they've given. Uh, I feel very confused right now, so I've got a few, actually just one question mainly. You did mention about the slippery slope argument, that if you would give rights to apes, therefore we should give it to dogs and cats, and you kind of dissuaded it. But I'm not here to argue whether uh, apes should get rights or not, but, the question, but I want to question the basis for which they deserve the rights. Is it based on a resemblance to humans, their cognitive ability, and therefore apes who behave like humans therefore should deserve rights? And isn't therefore this a discrimination by itself? And where do we therefore draw the line for other animals? I 
I tried to make that clear. So I actually like the slippery slope to happen. Uh, so for me, calling for rights for great apes is hopefully putting everybody on a slippery slope so that in the end there will be more inclusivity. inclusivity. So I'm an advocate strategically for the slippery slope and I like to put soap onto it. Got one at the front here and then. Um, yeah, I mean, just on that slippery slope argument, I mean, the kind of reductio ad absurdum for that would, would be, you know, how do you get the lion to respect the rights of the wildebeest? I mean, wh wh why do we have any obligation to any other species more than the lion would for the wildebeest? Yeah, so of course, there will be always be areas of conflict which still exist. So shouldn't I now all catch all the lions so they shouldn't eat the wildebeest or so? Um, and there will always be legal constructs which are not perfect, that's clear. But to use such, if you want, extreme argument to now say, uh, for that reason, I'm allowed to take a chimpanzee and operate uh, upon his brain uh, and then uh, put that suffering chimpanzee in a cage which is this big for 30 years, and that is what happens. Uh, then I think, well, I would rather err on the side of, I keep that problem with the line for later, let me look at that chimpanzee and bring a legal case against those who do that to that chimpanzee. So we don't have to be able to give an answer to all the questions in a totally non-contradictory way to start to act, because that will never happen. That principle is called meliorism, to somehow make it better, knowing that our minds will never be able to create the world in which all the contradictions disappear. Yes, um, do you not think it's um, rather prejudiced to only consider um, animals who feel and have feelings uh, to give them rights? Because, I mean, some humans appear not to feel anything. So why, why should not to do what? So say again. I couldn't understand you. Okay. Um, oh, feel. Is, yes, feel, feelings, emotions, yes, so yes. sentience. Yes, yes. Um, why, why only go? Why go by that? Because that's you know that's prejudice in itself, isn't it? Because as I said, some humans probably don't feel or don't appear to feel and have no emotions. Yeah. Um, so why not just accept if it's if it's a living then it has rights. And secondly, if I can, um, what about so-called indigenous uh, populations or tribal populations um, who traditionally hunt apes for food and so on? What do you think about that? Yeah. So the first uh, question, okay, uh, sentiocentrism, that you say, okay, they, they can feel and for that reason perhaps they should have rights, that's also not quite okay. It's up to us to talk about that question and for example a term like painism now tries to say okay you may not really be able to feel but probably you can feel pain uh, so there's another concept which then would perhaps be even more inclusive than uh, uh, sentiocentrism however to say anything that lives is again problematic because 90 percent of the body cells which are inside me are other organisms because they are one celled you know, bacteria and so on. So should they have a right to live? Should I not eat or should I eat more so they multiply more? And then we get into all kinds of paradoxes. Whatever we do, our boundaries will in the end be necessary and they will not be um, without contradictions. But that, that shouldn't stop us to, to do as good as we can, knowing that we will never be able to solve all the contradictions. The question about the indigenous uh, people who uh, eat um, uh, gorillas, let's say, or chimpanzees. Same question would apply here. If I come from a culture where it's perfectly acceptable to, uh, um, to uh, mutilate the genitals of, of, of girls, that should be respected, or the genitals of, of, of young boys without their consent. But societies which consider themselves to be democratic and to respect human rights would say, no, that's not acceptable. 
So it's not acceptable in this country also to torture animals, where it's acceptable in other countries just to do that for fun. You know? uh, so again, um, there will be uh, d decisions will have to be made for what is acceptable and for what is not acceptable. And um, clearly, uh, the debate will never end. But because that is clear, that doesn't mean we shouldn't start the debate and start to act on at least some issues. Uh, on that note, I think, have we got time for one more question? Or? Okay, T sorry, time to finish. Um, thank, can I uh, please have a hand in thanking Volker for <laughs> the excellent talk? Um, and I believe Volker's going to be sort of hanging around for a, a few minutes perhaps outside in case you have any pressing questions that you'd like to put to him personally. Uh, thanks everyone.